Today we're talking once again with Ontario's Minister of Education, Stephen Lecce. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Now, when we last spoke, there was still some uncertainty about the future of the school year. Now we know that by May 3rd, public schools will not be opening. So what can parents and students expect as of today? You know, I think uh, parents just want to know the future for their children and students and educators would uh, like the same information. And so what I can commit to parents is uh, two things. One is that we've decided based on the data that we need a bit more time, uh, that students will not be returning on the 4th of May. That's why the Premier of Ontario, Doug Ford, communicated that transparently to parents that they won't be returning. What we're doing right now is we're consulting with the Chief Officer of Health to determine what that date should look like. But my long-standing position has been, if it can, if we can safely get children back into schools towards the end of this school year, uh, so long as it is safe, I think we should. And I think parents would like to see us save some of the school year as long as it is safe. And I want to really emphasize that because we were the first province to close schools. We would never, ever compromise the safety of children. But if we can do it, and if the society starts to reopen and things start moving in a positive way, I think my instinct is to preserve some in-class instruction and I will be communicating in the coming days a plan that does that. And would students be expected to make up for the same exact amount of time that has been spent at home? Would that continue on until the next school year or would it be a more condensed uh, curriculum? You know, right now we're still having students learn from the safety of their home and that's the, the strength of our program. It's about continuing to keep kids educated, inspired in their learning from home led by a teacher. So that plan actually helps to mitigate scenarios where, you know, the school year could be in jeopardy. You know, I think if we maintain our current plan of having teachers work with their kids uh, virtually using technology to reach them, uh, I think students overwhelmingly will be well on their way to graduate uh, and to complete the curriculum. And as well, if we do have students, if we do have students return, uh, towards the late spring, so long as it is safe, then I think that in-class time coupled with the online time will make sure our kids are well prepared for the next year. If we think they're not, I want parents to know that we'll obviously come up with additional educational supports and look at a variety of tools. All options are on the table when it comes to ensuring children remain uh, well uh, invested in the curriculum and that they actually know the materials until they move to the next year. And I'm concerned actually about the online learning for a lot of grade school kids whose parents might be working from home. This time is busier than ever. We're obviously in the middle of a pandemic, so it's stressful. Mm -hmm. Have they been offered any alternatives or any options when it comes to workload and scheduling, especially when they have those young kids? Yeah, you know, I think often of my nieces, uh, you know, five and four years old, and I know it puts a lot of strain on working parents in Ontario. Uh, and that's why we really built in flexibility in our program. It's about giving parents the ability uh, to have a bit more flexibility of when their child can learn. And that's what we're asking educators to do, to build the schedules around, you know, to the extent possible, the needs of our parents that are facing very different challenges in their lives. Some of them are essential workers and um, uh, may not be home as much. So, you know, we've tried to limit the amount of time we're imposing on the child. We're trying to be reasonable. We know this is a pressure a heavy time, a lot of pressure on kids and on their parents uh, with health and economic challenges. So we're trying to be reasonable, but we also believe these kids got to keep learning. The alternative to not learning, uh, to not having um, standards, not having a teacher lead that education process is what other provinces, some other provinces are doing where literally they send kids home with homework and see in September. And I just don't think that is an acceptable reality. In Ontario, we've got the ingenuity, the know-how, the capacity, uh, we've got the resources to educate our kids and uh, we're going to do that and we're going to continue to build it up to make sure that they're learning the competencies they're going to need to get good jobs in the mark of the future. And what resources or alternatives are being provided to a lot of those students who learn differently? I mean, I'll be honest, in university, I struggled with e-learning a lot too. So, you know, there's a lot of students that might not find themselves successful with a lot of the online tools. And I want to know if they're also being offered you know, different scenarios? Well, I think the first thing is, you know, is what we're trying to do is we're trying to make this period of time to be about learning the new skill sets. I mean, what we've tried to encourage educators, what we have encouraged educators to do 
is use this period of virtual distant learning. If there's an opportunity to improve a student's mark because they've done some really great work, let's allow that coursework to be graded to improve a mark. But our aim is really not to reduce marks over this period, to accept the mark as of the day of the school closure in March, but use this period to continue learning, continue challenging our students to learn. And if they can do good work, if they're comfortable and able to do it, uh, you know, uh, for you and even to some extent, even for I perhaps, that would have been a strength many, uh, many moons ago, for at least for myself. Uh, I tell you that, um, you know, having that flexibility means that I'm not going to fall behind because I'm at a disadvantage versus, let's say, my neighbor who's really good at all my learning. So the program is designed to never have someone stay behind. It's to keep everyone moving in the same direction. We're also providing professional development to our educators, to our parents, supports for them, guidance videos, how to do it. And of course, for the kids. I know this is a big change. This is a huge change. We took 2 million students that were in a class on a Thursday and, you know, in a matter of a week, uploaded them into uh, online learning within literally a week. It's the biggest uh, educational transformation in, I think, Canadian history. But, you know, my commitment to parents is to keep children learning, to keep them safe, and most importantly, to improve this program. And I know with the feedback I've been receiving from parents and from educators and students themselves, including some very uh, energetically uh, opinionated nieces of mine in the Catholic system, I will tell you that you know, um, we're going to continue to listen to those and improve the system so that our kids can get ahead. Because the, the fact is, we have to be prepared for this type of challenge that could happen in this country, and in this world, including in the fall and beyond. So we're going to make sure we build this up, get this right, and do the very best we can for every child so that they can learn. I know it's hard to think about what's going to happen after this pandemic, but do you think that e-learning or online education is something that is going to be a very useful tool in the future for Ontario? Is it something that maybe schools will start resorting to? Yeah, I mean, this is distant learning versus online learning. But, you know, I would say that I think what it may do is it may uh, underscore the importance of having this technology, this capacity. Because look, you know, natural disaster or pandemic or other uh, difficulty that could face nations uh, I think we have to be ready for this. And I think this, this outbreak has really demonstrated that we've got to have an effective backstop so that if, it, God forbid, we can't be in class uh, you know, uh, on Friday, we can literally remotely and safely digitally move learning into a virtual experience where literally you could have this type of interaction with your teacher, you could ask questions, um, you could upload assignments, you could learn and you can uh, participate in a dynamic way versus you know, getting an email or uh, you know, getting a stack of papers and t saying, you know, saying to these students, we'll see in 30 or 90 days. So th this really will inform how we improve it so that kids continue learning safely. But I also believe that there will be an opportunity for all of us to uh, embrace this form of learning because the alternative really is no learning. So I love to listen to parents' feedback uh, and students' feedback and educators' feedback about how we can make this better more inclusive, more effective, uh, and more dynamic so that a child can enjoy this experience. And so far, what I'm hearing from many students is they are. And another resource that's really important right now, apart from e-learning, is of course the mental health resources for so many students that are finding themselves right now in just a lot of confusion and anxiety. Can you talk to us about that mental health resource that was just launched? Yeah, you know, mental health is a big priority for my family. Uh, so many young people uh, face mental health challenges and afflictions, and uh, it can be anxiety or nervousness or confusion about this. And this happens to our youngest learners all the way to those in the senior years. And I want students to know two things. The first is uh, you're not alone. I mean, uh, there's uh, so many students and peers that feel that sense of unease. Uh, but I also want you to know that we are resolved as a society, as a government, as a people, as a country, to make sure that you, particularly our youngsters, uh, get through this with strength and confidence, graduate, and ultimately, you know, have very, very positive futures in the job market. So uh, the mental health is important, which is why we've provided, uh, announced an additional $12 million in emergency funding to some critical partners like Kids Help Book. And for students out there, you know, if you have, if you're watching today, uh, I want you to feel comfortable, send a text message, it's confidential, uh, to Kids Help Phone, you just text the word CONNECT to 686868, 
they're a partner in the Ministry of Education, they're trusted, they're awesome, they do good work. Uh, there's many other resources that we're investing in to make sure that no matter who you are or wherever you are in this province, urban or rural, you have access to those supports. And I know parents care deeply about their kids, and I'm encouraging them to talk to them, as I'm sure many of them have, about what COVID means to our society, to our health, to our economy, and to our lives, and how each, each young person, literally one person, could help make a difference. You know, I, students require 90 hours of graduation. Uh, sorry, it require 40 hours of volunteer service to graduate. Obviously, now that you can't you know, necessarily do a lot of volunteer work these days because of COVID. But I said, you know what, we're going to waive that requirement to make sure students graduate. But I'm going to ask them voluntarily, take on a service project in your community. You know, call a local seniors home and FaceTime with seniors who feel isolated. You know, help raise funds or awareness uh, of COVID-19. There's so many ways ordinary people are doing extraordinary things. And there's a way young people could also play a really powerful role today and well into the future of how we respond to challenges. Absolutely. That's such a great initiative because there are so many ways that each of us at home can really contribute to our communities. So I really like that idea. Do you have any final words or final message that you'd like to share with all of our viewers back home? Yeah, I just want to thank you all. I mean, I am really proud uh, of, you know, as the son of immigrants, you know, my parents came to Italy uh, post-war. And, you know, you just reflect on the challenges that are facing back in Italy and Spain and many other parts of the world. And I'm proud of this country. I mean, honestly, we should be so proud that our countries come together, our governments are working together, we're united uh, with one mission, which is to get through this and recover with strength, make sure we keep uh, people's lives and jobs uh, and incomes. And really, I think it reflects the spirit of this country, that people are doing amazing things, charities, nonprofits, businesses, stepping up to build ventilators and masks. And, you know, a school in my community, uh, St. Um, uh, uh, St. Angela is building uh, uh, really uh, these, you know, the, the new protective equipment uh, masks, those shielded masks using a 3D printer at a school. I mean, it's really neat to see this type of work happening. And it shows that the province and country and the people that proudly uh, live in it, I think, are stepping up and punching above their weight. And I'm really proud of you. So thank you all for staying home, for watching this from the comfort of your coach. Keep doing that. Stay healthy. And hopefully soon enough, we will get through this and we'll be able to do this in person. Absolutely. We will come out of this stronger than ever before. Thank you so much, Minister Lecce. Thank you.